Good evening, everyone out there in the virtual realm. My name is Miriam Meckel, and I'm very delighted to host this conversation tonight with the CEO of Alphabet and Google, Sundar Pichai. Good morning, Sundar. Hi, Miriam. How are you? I'm good, actually. I'm far away, but uh, I'm good. It would have been much nicer to, to talk to each other in person, but that'll be possible, hopefully, next year again. Well, I'm glad we, we can do this virtually. And, uh, you know, as you said, hopefully uh, it changes over the course of the year. I think so. So maybe we just jump into our conversation about insights and ideas with, um, um, yeah, connecting the last year and to the year that uh, just began. Um, a year of restrictions uh, lies behind us. Recession um, is still going on and 2021 just begun. How do you encourage the, the people around you, the teams at Google, maybe even yourself, to somehow still trust in the power of technology in the power of technological innovation? Give us a streak of light, please. Um, you know, it's something I think about a lot. Uh, you know, uh, I... I'm a technology optimist, uh, not because I believe in technology, but I believe in how people come together uh, to use technology for good. Uh, from my personal experience, uh, you know, it's always resonated with me uh, because technology created opportunities in my personal life. I see countless examples around the world uh, of how technology is driving progress. COVID itself has been a moment of reflection. And uh, while you see all the you know, hard impact around the world, you also see the role technology plays in you know, how most of the economy is still functioning around the world. Uh, the vaccine development, uh, you realize it's happening on a foundation of technological progress over the past uh, many decades when you see uh, advances like mRNA come into fruition, and you know it's going to be uh, applicable to other hard problems down the line. Uh, within uh, Alphabet, as DeepMind made progress with AlphaFold, uh, you had a moment where AI in a few years made an advance. You know, it's a 50-year breakthrough in terms of protein folding, and I can see its potential uh, to streamline aspects of drug development. And, and so it gives me hope that 10 to 20 years down the line for the next challenge, uh, you know, it's a foundation which will help drive progress. And that's how the virtuous cycle continues. And so, you know, as a company, uh, you know, I take a long-term view uh, and whenever you step back, you see the long arc of uh, technological progress. And, you know, that's what I talk to my teams about and uh, gives me optimism uh, through this very, very difficult time. Let's break this down a bit. I'm, I'm totally with you regarding the, the messenger RNA. I think that's really a breakthrough. I mean, a vaccine regularly takes like five years and, and longer to be developed, uh, to be researched. And now we have it already in different, different forms. On the other hand, what I observed is that artificial intelligence, for example, didn't play such a big role in, in um, the, the, the analysis of COVID in, in many regards. Um, it was kind of underwhelming. Let me put it like that. And now we have huge difficulties with the distribution of the vaccine. Couldn't AI help with that? You know, I think, uh, I mean, today we have the technology tools to help with you know, uh, you know, cloud computing and, you know, machine learning and algorithms exist today. I think the real potential of AI will come, uh, you know, we are still in very early days of AI. And, and I think all of this will come into play, uh, you know, in a 10 to 20 year time frame. But having said that, uh, you know, I see countless. So for example, when you look at, uh, you know, how, how did we as a company deal with you know, making sure users got the right information around COVID and preventing misinformation. I mean, we did rely on AI algorithms to make a lot of decisions and, and you know, it's a, it's a difficult area. And I think AI contributed significantly to help us uh, make progress there. But, but you know, the, the pandemic is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a one in a hundred year event globally. And uh, I don't think AI played your right. Uh, any significant role in helping us uh, navigate it. It is the foundations of all the technological progress over the past many years. And I think AI is laying the foundation for us to tackle future problems 
uh, you know, our current problems like climate change and, uh, you know, how do you solve uh, the next advances in healthcare and so on. If you figure a pandemic in, let's say, 10 or 15 years, what would then be different with the progress of AI you were just describing for our future? You know, I mean, you know, the, our ability to, you know, detect, uh, plan, coordinate, uh, you know, and drive the next generation of therapeutics and vaccines, etc. Everything will, you know, assuming as humanity, we use this moment to learn from it and, and apply our, uh, you know, creativity and uh, uh, resources you know, I think we will tackle it definitely better the next time around. And, and so I see all of this in a cross-cutting way uh, help drive progress. And, uh, and, you know, so, for example, you can see even through this pandemic, we, we had shortage of masks. We learned what is the right mask guidance uh, through the course of a pandemic. I mean, these are all, uh, you know, simple things to get right the next time. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, how do you accelerate therapeutics? Uh, you know, I think AI will play a big role uh, by the time we have to deal with the next one. So it's not just about machine learning systems. It's still about human learning systems as well to tackle issues like that. Absolutely. So now, you just you just mentioned uh, the problem of, of misinformation around COVID, and there was quite a lot. I would like to, to take a moment to, to take it to a little bit uh, of, a, of a meta level and also look uh, at what what happened uh, in the start of uh, during the start of this year um, in many ways um, 2021 has started very unexpectedly or maybe not but maybe yes what went through your mind when you saw the pictures of a mob storming the u.s capitol on january 6th I mean, it, it, it was a horrible feeling, uh, you know, and never in a million years uh, I thought you would see, it, you know, in one of the best functioning democracies in the world, uh, you know, transitions of uh, power are, you know, hallmark of uh, democracy working well. And, you know, definitely shocked me the same way I think it shocked uh, people around the world. And, and I'm glad uh, the reaction was what it was. And, and it's a learning moment for uh, all of us. And I think, you know, you realize that the foundations of uh, democracy, democracies are essentially fragile and it takes all of us to understand that and reinforce it uh, every way we can. I think um, we can find some some um, twist also in in um, how the public sees uh, the whole issue of misinformation. Um, there was a study published today that says um, uh, that some something like fifty nine percent of the American people um, surveyed in an online poll uh, think um, they support breaking up big tech because of the issue of um, monopolies of dominance and of misinformation. What, what do you make of that? You know, I think there are uh, real uh, issues, important societal issues to be debated about, you know, uh, uh, you know where do the boundaries lie with uh, freedom of speech? Uh, what do we need for a well-functioning society? These are important questions. Uh, no single company can solve them. And, you know, and I am glad there are conversations including uh, potential regulatory uh, approaches uh, to give uh, clearer rules of the road. And, and I think large technology companies have, a, have an important role and responsibility uh, to get this right. And you know, for us as Google, it's foundational to our mission. Every single day in search, we get uh, you know, billions of queries, 15% of it, which we have never seen before. And we work hard to present the most accurate information possible. And, and, but having said that, I mean, the internet is so distributed. Um, there are conversations happening across every aspect of the internet. Uh, you see important, even just yesterday, when you see the, uh, uh, you know, the conversations in the US around the stock market, movements in stock, where the conversations are happening, shows that, you know, internet is, uh, you know, disseminating information at a scale never seen before. Uh, this phenomenon is bigger than any single company. It is here to stay. And I think as a society, we need to develop uh, the next set of frameworks uh, for us to 
you know, function through that. And, and I think that's the debate we are in the middle of. We take our role as a company seriously, but, uh, and, and I think, and rightfully, there needs to be focus on the larger companies. But I would, I would argue that, the, you know, it's an internet-wide issue, and, and I, think, I think the debate needs to be deeper. I, I like the idea of, of working on a new framework. I think that is something that uh, is, is probably necessary and will take a while. And the whole issue of, of uh, freedom of speech, it's, it's a really difficult question um, we are facing right now, because um, even though you, you're, you rightly say that, that uh, single companies can't decide about freedom of speech and what uh, is on the internet and what is banned from the internet, um, in a situation like the 6th of January and the days after, Uh, some de decisions had to be taken. So a very practical question. Do you think Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey took the right decision in banning the ex-US President Donald Trump from Twitter? You know, I, I mean, I do think, you know, platforms operate in a context and, you know, I, I think, you know, every platform needs to have clear, transparent uh, rules about what is allowed, what's not allowed, and you have to do it in the context of what's right for your platform. So, you know, I definitely don't want to comment on another platform. What I would say is, uh, I think uh, collectively, all of us uh, were dealing with an extraordinary moment uh, where we saw, uh, you know, the potential for uh, real harm in the physical world and, you know, potential for incitement to violence. And I think, You know, uh, you know, free speech is foundational. As a company, we have always stood for free speech, uh, but there are boundaries, which I think as societies, uh, we need to agree on. And, you know, incitement to violence is an example of one of those kinds of boundaries. So that's the context in which I think we need to look at, look at the moment. And uh, I think, but I do, to go back to my earlier point, I do think it's important for governments to, you know, debate this and give clearer guidance. The answers are going to vary. Uh, there is no one size fits all. Uh, I think it's important. Different companies have different approaches. I think I think that gives people choice. But I think we need clearer rules of the road. And and uh, I think there are a variety of approaches governments are looking at. Uh, for example, I think ensuring that policies are transparent. Uh, decisions are explained. People have a way to appeal those decisions and overall companies issuing transparency reports. Those are all examples of uh, clear rules, I think, uh, like we have done in privacy with GDPR. Uh, you know, I think there are advances like that which we need to, uh, need to uh, undertake. Google just opened a second safety engineering center in Dublin, in Ireland, uh, and it's, uh, as to my knowledge, the first one specifically focused on content responsibility. That sounds like a small step toward a clearer acknowledgement that the technical platform and the content provided on it can't be separated, is it? it, it You know, I'm very excited about it. It's our second uh, Google Safety Engineering Center. The first is in Munich, uh, in Germany, uh, on privacy. Uh, this, is on, this is focused on content responsibility, not just brings our experts, technical and policy experts and our trust and safety teams, but allows us to engage uh, with other stakeholders, including academic government experts, uh, et cetera. You know, content responsibility is an ongoing. We will never be done with this work. Uh, you know, we take it very seriously. It's one of our largest areas of investment. And I see that, you know, I gave the search example in YouTube. It's been our biggest area of focus for the past four years. And, and I look at many areas and I see the progress we have made. But the scale of the Internet, I earlier mentioned, you know, how the context keeps changing. Uh, you know, something like COVID didn't exist a year ago, right? And, and so on, on a given day, uh, the nature of information and the problems, you know, these are constantly evolving. And, and, and so I think that's why we are setting up this center. It gives us a way to engage uh, externally. And, you know, I, I, I don't think uh, these are societal level problems and you're going to need multiple stakeholders You need public-private partnerships uh, to get this right. And, and I think for us, uh, we want to set up organizations and a way by which we can engage, particularly in Europe. So I'm really excited for it. 
Mm -hmm. The political year um, is expected to bring uh, something like a paradigm change in terms of Czech governance. What do you anticipate from the new Biden-Harris government administration? You know, I think, uh, you know, it's definitely early days. Uh, you know, as a company, we've always been committed to engaging with the government, uh, regardless of uh, an administration. As a company, we want to do our part. So, for example, if it's uh, COVID, uh, we've been focused on what our role can be in, uh, in economic recovery, supporting small businesses, helping people gain digital skills. Uh, you know, we have uh, announced initiatives around racial equity, Uh, vaccination, uh, how can we help in vaccination? So we are going to engage on uh, areas where we can find common ground and, and advocate for it. Uh, sustainability has been an important uh, area of focus for us. Uh, I've been encouraged, uh, you know, along certain dimensions. I think the transatlantic alliance is something that needs to be, uh, you know, invested in and restored. And I think it's really important when I look at challenges like sustainability or AI regulation and safety, we are going to need uh, you know, more global cooperation. And so I'm encouraged uh, by the early signals uh, from, the, from the administration. But the question of, of how the Biden-Harris administration will deal with big tech is, of course, not just about uh, cooperation. Uh, we are uh, talking hard facts there uh, in terms of competition law, um, um, issues of monopolies. How do you prepare for um, a time that might be much more uncomfortable for you as a company as well as other big tech companies? You know, I've, I've long you know, held the view that it's appropriate for, uh, you know, democratic societies to hold large companies accountable. And, and the school, you know, this is not new to us and the administration change, you know, we have had, uh, you know, either uh, processes and procedures in the context of previous administrations as well. I, I, I'm glad uh, there are, you know, uh, proper processes. It allows us to engage, explain what we do, Uh, you know, as a company, we've always always been focused for 21 years on uh, making sure we are innovating, uh, contributing value to society, helping drive uh, products and services for users in a beneficial way. And as part of that, we will engage constructively. There may be feedback on uh, on changes we need to undertake, and you know, we we feel it's our responsibility to do that as well. So I don't necessarily see that as a new thing. It is something definitely that comes with scale. And, and I, you know, I think it's our uh, duty to engage with, uh, uh, with uh, regulatory bodies, with uh, you know, democratic societies, and, and answer the questions they have. And so I see it as a natural part of our uh, evolution. Okay. We have talked a lot about stakeholder capitalism at this World Economic Forum. It's not a new concept, but uh, I think especially in, in these days when, when we kind of recalibrate um, the values of how we work together, how our, our economy uh, thrives and all these kinds of things, that's a concept to, to be reconsidered. And um, I would like to, to ask you um, how you how you combine that a few days ago, Google workers across the globe announced Alpha Global, an international union alliance to hold Alphabet accountable in a way. Do the employees um, have the feeling or do you have the feeling the employees might think they have to take the matter of stakeholder capitalism into their own hands now? You know, I think, uh, you know, as a company, we've always held a view that, uh, you know, that employees, uh, you, know, sh you know, are an important constituency for us. Uh, you know, we, we deeply care about our employees. Uh, we give, uh, you know, giving voice to employees is a core part of our culture. And, and we engage with uh, many employee resource groups in many forums, including in Europe. Uh, you know, we've had European worker councils uh, for a long time. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I think this is not new for us. Uh, I think listening is an important part of our culture. And, and I do think we want to work with our employees to drive progress together, be it on areas like sustainability or diversity and inclusion. And so I, I think I continue to believe that, uh, you know, companies which are able to engage with employees and involve them, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's a strength of the company, I feel. And so that's how I think about it. 
I would like to, to press you on that a little bit more with one more question, because Google has been struggling with a series of employee issues these, day, these days. Um, there was one with the, with the most public awareness uh, being the, the, depending on the perspective, um, resignation or, or um, firing of Timnit Gebru, a well-reputed researcher on Google's ethical AI team. How seriously does Google take the issue of the critical questioning required to develop a responsible AI? And how, yeah, how independent can a research um, um, in a company be to really address these questions? Um, you know, I mean, issues around, I've always, AI is one of the most profound things we are working on and, uh, you know, developing it responsibly uh, is one of the most important things for us to get right. As a company, we have publicly committed to uh, AI principles. Uh, we are, uh, you know, one of the leaders in industry in terms of uh, the research we do around uh, AI ethics and we published over 200 papers. Uh, in the past uh, year or so. But I think you're raising an important question, which is, I don't, I don't think, I don't see it as company. We are committed to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing the best we can in terms of uh, approaching our work in a responsible way and pursuing AI ethics. But I think there is an extraordinarily important role uh, for regulation for, I've said AI is too important an area not to be regulated, for independent institutions academic, other nonprofit institutions uh, to, to do this. And, and I don't think companies alone uh, can get this right. I think part of the reason you see, uh, you know, a lot of debate, I mean, we engage uh, as a company, we are a lot more transparent than most other companies. And so you do see us in the middle of these issues, uh, but I, I, take it, uh, I take it as a sign that, you know, we allow for, uh, debate to happen around this area, and we need to get better as a company. We are committed to doing so, uh, but I, you know, I look at the state of how we approach this, and and uh, you know, I am confident about the effort we are putting into it and our commitment to do better here over time. Maybe let's use um, the last minute to, to take a look at, at new technologies and how they might help our economies, our societies to thrive. At the end of November last year, Google's DeepMind, you mentioned that at the beginning of our conversation, announced a gigantic leap in solving protein structures. The deep learning software AlphaFold manages to accurately predict protein structures from their amino acid sequ sequence. Can you give us an example um, of the practical value of this breakthrough? What will we do with that? I mean, I think uh, it's today, you know, drug development is uh, extraordinarily involved process, uh, you know, both in terms of time and resources, in terms of people and money. And, and what, uh, what something like AlphaFold gives the, gives the chances for, uh, biotech, pharmaceutical companies, anyone in the drug development process uh, to be to become much more efficient and streamlined and, and to find the right uh, protein structures uh, for a target uh, uh, problem and so effectively streamline the development of a solution. And so I view it as uh, very profound, but you know it's one step of a, a complicated drug development process. But that's how advances happen, you know, and uh, when, when we made progress with messenger RNA technology, today we are uh, deploying it in the context of a pandemic. So I view it as a foundational advance. And, uh, you know, and I think, um, you know, I see countless examples across the company. And, uh, you know, about 18 months ago, we demonstrated quantum uh, supremacy as a company. And I think it's an, another example of a foundational advance, which will help us maybe model, uh, you know, climate better in the future. And I think progress takes uh, time. And, uh, you know, I think all of the internet today is built on some foundational technologies which were developed uh, 30, 40 years ago. And so that's how we achieve progress. I still don't like the term quantum supremacy. It sounds like a very military phrase. <laughs> I prefer quantum advantage, but uh, stick to let, let's stick to, to what, what might come out of that. When will this technology be available for a broader market, quantum, quantum computing? I think what you will see is over the next uh, three to five years, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, a few places will give outside companies and developers 
uh, to you know a quantum cloud, if you will, uh, for them to uh, you know tackle early research problems. So we are definitely early in the cycle. I think um, you know the demonstrations you know show the potential of what's possible, and that's why we are all excited about it. But I think you are on a ten to twenty year journey of of really bringing it to uh, you know actual practical practical use. But the next three to five years will be exciting because you know you can harness the creativity of the world. That is, you can let other developers uh, you know test quantum applications by providing uh, the quantum infrastructure which we are building uh, with the APIs to the outside world. And I'm really excited for that. Are you worried that Chinese researchers announced uh, at the end of last year to have reached quantum advantage as well? Will that be the next battle of the tech titan nations somehow? You know, there is no doubt to me, uh, you know, across the world, there are going to be progress in areas like AI and, uh, and quantum. Uh, I mean, these are foundational areas. Uh, you know, China with its uh, technology resources, Uh, the investment from the government is definitely going to make progress uh, across these areas as well. Uh, you know, which is why, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, to my earlier point, we are going to need uh, better global frameworks for AI safety. Just like to tackle something like climate change, uh, we have the notion of a Paris Agreement. We need countries to come together because no single country can solve a planetary issue. I think issues around, you know, as technology progresses with AI and and quantum computing, we're going to need additional frameworks like that to ensure safety uh, for the planet. And and so I think I think it's important to acknowledge there is going to be global progress. And I think uh, you know we should think early and 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 come together uh, uh, to solve uh, solve the bigger. Uh, longer-term safety issues from these technologies. So we somehow need a global quantum regulation framework. Who is going to provide for that? Uh, it's not just quantum. It's around you know AI safety and and uh, you know we need to make sure that uh, you know uh, you know just like in the past we have had other frameworks uh, globally and they are definitely not easy to do. It needs uh, willing countries and governments and, and, and uh, uh, you know, enough set of committed people to drive progress here. And, uh, and you know, I think uh, it will be multi-decade efforts. But, uh, you know, I, I expect, for example, I hope uh, in, in G20, in OECD, I mean, uh, these are all the forums and, you know, that there are discussions happening around this. And I think, again, you're going to need public-private partnerships to drive all of this forward. Let me challenge you in, in one more uh, meta perspective regarding quantum computing. Quantum computers uh, work by the principle of entanglement from quantum mechanics, which means that each particle of the pair or group cannot be described independently of the state of the others. What I thought is, isn't that kind of a wonderful metaphor of the world we are living in and might teach us uh, something about humbly accepting complexity, accepting ambiguity in the state of the world we are living in right now? Uh, you know, definitely, you know, quantum computing is one of those uh, wonderful things in which the more you spend time uh, trying to understand it, it's humbling and you get very philosophical in nature. Uh, no one other than the great Richard Feynman said, anyone who claims to understand co quantum computing uh, doesn't really understand it. I and mean, you get the exact quote wrong, but uh, I, think, uh, I, I think there is definitely something about the notion that uh, the physical world as we perceive it uh, doesn't represent the underlying reality. And, uh, and uh, as a humanity, we have a long way to go before we understand uh, the true nature uh, in a deeper way. What I am excited about quantum physics and quantum computing is it gives us a, a chance to get closer uh, to that understanding one day. One last question. Looking at uh, your background, what is that little dinosaur right behind you on the shelf? Oh, I, uh, you know, I think when we were developing Chrome, uh, the browser, uh, you know, when there was no internet connectivity, Uh, you could play the uh, dino game. And so it's something we did in our early days. And so 
uh, it's a little bit of an Easter egg for me <laughs> that I, I carry with at times. I thought it's something like never look back to uh, the things that have been est extinguished forever, but look uh -huh. look to the future, maybe. <laughs> uh, I think I think that's a good perspective to carry too. Yeah. So um, we're running out of time. Thank you very much for this conversation and the insights and ideas. Sunda, it was a pleasure. And thanks to everyone out there in the virtual realm. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Miriam. And thanks to the World Economic Forum for organizing uh, this. Appreciate it.